Hi, everyone, and welcome to Book Break. I'm Claire and a librarian here at the Greece Public Library. And today I have a special guest with me, Anne Marie. Hi, Claire. Hey. <laughs> So today we are going to chat a little bit about our 10 to try challenge and some of the books that Anne Marie and I have read or some of the things we've done to, to get through the challenge. Um, we're not going to be in the, the lineup for the prizes, so don't worry about that. But Anne Marie and I thought we would just give you some ideas about what we're reading and kind of what we're doing. So... Do you like challenges on the whole? I love a challenge because really? it helps me direct myself a little bit and try some new things and go back to maybe some old favorites or I don't know. I had a lot of fun with this challenge. Yeah, I think it has a little bit in it for everybody and it's not like too much reading. Like there's some things that aren't reading, so that's kind of fun. Um, yeah, Did you already complete Anne Marie? I have not oh, completed. Okay. Gotcha. No, I have to do a classic, so oh. that's why we we're talking about some classics and where we might go with that. Yeah, maybe some people have some suggestions of cl good classics that we could try. Oh, that that's always welcome. Yeah. So the first one is try something new, attend a program, or try a new library service, and. I think one of the things that's interesting is you just started a new program where people can pick up art materials and stuff. Yeah, we've had two months of it so far, um, so it's still a brand new program. It's Creativity on the Go for Adults, and so the teen program like that was really going well, so we thought we'd reach out to adults since they wanted the teen kits. So um, we did diamond dot painting last month, and this month is meditative coloring. And we'll branch out into some other more kind of experimental stuff and just see where it takes us. But yeah. I, I like the idea of people being able to come in and get it and bring it home, do it at their own pace, learn I something I like it new. too, and I love when people share what they've made with us. So if you're the kind of person that likes to just snap a picture with your phone or something and send it to us, Anne Marie will have a contact information on that. So, and I recently started Coffee and Creativity, which is a very, like a simple art or craft. We've done ornaments for Christmas, and February we did Valentine Gnome. So, um, and Mindy That's has fun. a lot of genealogy talks. Um, there's all different kinds of things. So, Senior Hour is picking up again. So, yeah, by all means, try a new library program. And then challenge two is read a book from your to-be-read list. So this one I've already done. And my book in the January book break, I talked about a book called Mrs. Quinn's Rise to Fame. And it was the type of thing is when I saw it was compared to like for fans of the Great British Baking Show, I was like, I'm in. Fun. Totally. Um, so this one... It is a lady named Jenny. She's been married for 59 years. Her husband, Bernard, his health is kind of declining. Her friends all have grandchildren, and she and Bernard have never had children. So she doesn't really have that in common with them. So she decides that she wants to do something for herself. And one thing she's always been really good at is baking. And she and her husband watch, they call it, Britain Bakes on in this book, but mm. you know exactly what show they're talking about. They even have the tent and everything. Um, so she secretly enters the contest, and believe it or not, she's she's chosen. Of course she is. Uh, yeah, of <laughs> course. So um, at first she loves the challenges. She um, is meeting new people. You know, she has, like, no knowledge of social media and all this stuff and she has a nephew or somebody that's helping her make videos. So it's a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of pressure. And this pressure starts bringing back these memories from an earlier part of her life and that she kind of buried before her marriage. So that was the thing about this book, is you kind of have these two things, this really fun show going on, although there are elements of, like, her husband's getting older and she's starting to see changes in him and you know, facing that part of your life and what do you want to accomplish before you get to that part of your life. So um, 
all the recipes are from her family, so that was kind of interesting. And that is, I think, another reason why she keeps bringing some of this up. Mm. But um, that was the one thing I really didn't like so much about the book was this secret, you know. And it really wasn't too hard to figure out. And, of course, I don't, I don't want to spoil it and tell anybody. But um, So does that lend a whole dark kind of twist to the book? Or? A little bit of a dark twist, hmm. yeah. I'd say most of it is really fun because you're concentrating on the show and everything. But there is some sadness, like, you know, her husband has a health scare. You know, she's trying to deal with why she's kept this secret from her marriage. And he's a really, really oh. nice guy. So I don't know why she did. But... Um, I would say if you like food, if you like kind of inspiring stories, and of course, if you like the great British breaking show, this might be a good book for you. It's definitely an older protagonist, too, which is something a little different. You don't really get to see a lot of people that age depicted in books, mm -hmm. um, yeah. especially trying something new like this. So, yeah, I'd say, you know, three and a half, four stars for me. Did you try any recipes? I have not. No, mm. I didn't. I read this one um, in like ebook form. I got it as a, a net galley, so it's not the same as looking as a physical book. Yeah, you know, for me yeah. to like see recipes and stuff. Right. But, but no, I thought it. I thought it was good. Hmm. Sounds really interesting. Yeah. I hadn't heard of it before. Who's yeah. the author? The author was. Olivia Ford. Olivia Ford. Yeah, published Ooh. January 30th. Of last year. This, this year. This year. Oh, yeah. so it's brand, it, it was, brand new. Yes, it was brand, brand new. How so fun. it was okay. something I was looking forward to being published in 2024. Okay, right. So, so did you have one for I, your to be, that I, you crossed off your to be read list? I do have one on there. So on my to be read list, I basically wanted to, it wasn't a specific title, I wanted to read something about the eclipse. Oh, okay. So uh, because I kind of feel like I, I, I know it's coming, I know it's exciting, but I don't exactly understand it. And so I looked at some nonfiction, huh, not for me, a little too much. And um, then some adult fiction, which seemed really kind of dystopian and scary so I found a middle grade book a middle reader book so it's kind of for ages 8 to 12 and it happens to be by an author I really like I've read other books by her her name's Wendy Moss and the book is Every Soul a Star and um, even though the characters kind of started off a little stereotypical um, they ended up through her their adventure and uh, the things that they were they had to overcome um, being really well-developed characters so the premise is the eclipse is coming the great eclipse now this was written in 2008 so we're not talking about the eclipse we're about to have mm -hmm. in April um, this was just, they called it the Great Eclipse. And there's one point in the United States where it's the best place to view the eclipse, to be in the total point of totality. Right. And which we know here in Rochester is so important because we are on the path of totality. Right, correct. I love telling all of my out-of-state friends that. And um, so anyway, the point of totality is... Shadow Lake Campground, out in the middle of nowhere. And there's a family that bought the campground 10 years prior, knowing this was going to be the place that everybody wanted to be. And there's a girl who's 13 in the family, and she loves where she lives. She loves the stars. She loves the openness and the remoteness. She's homeschooled, of course, because mm -hmm. they're in the middle of nowhere. And she wants to be an astronomer. And she has big, big lofty goals with that. So she's thrilled that the eclipse is coming. And then we have this um, boy, and his name is Jack. And he is kind of low self-confidence, um, 
a little stereotypical. He's a little overweight. He loves art. He sits in the back of the class and doodles. And that's how he's worked himself into having to go to summer school. And so they strike a deal. The science teacher happens to be leading the eclipse tour from his town. And um, is apparently some sort of uh, expert in eclipses. And so Jack goes along with the science teacher to Shadow Lake or Moon Shadow uh, Campground. He's dragged along reluctantly, doesn't really know what he's in for, um, but he's there to help collect data. And then there's Bree, and Bree is kind of a stereotypical girl with great aspirations of being a model and being on the cover of Seventeen magazine. And <laughs> and she's dragged along with her family to the campground because she doesn't know it yet, but the family has purchased the campground. And it's going to change hands the day after the eclipse. Oh, wow. So you have those three kids coming together and a, a whole mess of thousands of campers and situations while they're there and they end up having to help rescue each other and um, carry through with the grand plan of collecting the important data that you can only get in the moment of the eclipse and they emerge more self-confident and just it's a warm kind of loving story in the end so there's my eclipse story. It has tons of science in it, though. And that's, okay. that's the most important part. Yeah. Uh, it's interwoven really well, and Sometimes you learn a lot. I like a good middle grade story. You know, they're easy, they're fast to read. But um, they sometimes have really good messages. Really good messages. And I don't know, it's kind of nice to be thrown back to thinking of where you were, mm -hmm. you know, in your tween years and hopefully how far you've come right <laughs> or the lessons you still have to learn so i recommend it highly for anyone who wants a book on the eclipse okay kind of understand it more sounds good all right so challenge three is try a new genre or one out of your comfort zone <laughs> So what I decided to do is I have been wanting to try they call it cli-fi which is climate fiction um described as being generally speculative but inspired by climate science so so speculative fiction yeah so it's, it's, like it's getting a little bit more popular of course with all the storms fires and so forth that we have yeah. occurring now but this one was called the light pirate by lily brooks dalton and i believe it was published in 2023 and here is the setup Florida, as we know it, is slipping away. So a powerful hurricane is headed towards the coast, and there are there's a main family, Kirby, who is an electrical kind of line worker. He is bound and determined to ride out this storm. So he's putting the sandbags down, you know, getting ready for when he knows he's going to be called into emergency service. He has a very pregnant wife. This is his second wife, Frida, and she is absolutely terrified. She wants to flee. Um, she's just, she's had a lot of trauma from storms in her past, and that's actually where she met her husband, was her mom, and she used to sail a boat, and they went to Puerto Rico. They took shelter inland. It didn't matter you know, storm blew their roof off their house and her mother, you know, didn't make it and she did. But this is where she meets Kirby. She was an architecture student at Rice University in Houston. Um, so she ends up now in this totally different life path. She left school, married Kirby, um, and now she's very, very pregnant. And he has two sons. So she's trying to get her sons to eat you know, these two boys to eat dinner. They're making fun of her because she's like the stepmom and they don't want to listen to her. So they sneak out of the house. And now the storm has hit. So Kirby goes off looking for his sons. She goes into labor. Oh, gosh. And this is where the book takes off. So um, Frida has a baby girl in the midst of this storm. And she names her Wanda. 
after the storm. So then the next part of the book is really about Wanda and how now there's only one brother left. You know, people died in the, the first storm. Um, and they're, they're trying to acclimate to living. And you can see as society is gradually starting to shut down because the towns are going bankrupt because they can't afford all the work to stay open anymore. And, you know, with the water and the flooding and just all these different things that you don't think about, but suddenly make sense. And you're like, Oh, Oh yeah, I can totally see that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, and if that manual, manual, you know, manual, Ma what is the word I'm trying to think of? Manual labor? No, mandated. Mandated, oh, mandated. Uh, evacuations oh. and all these types of things. And of course, Kirby won't go, you know, um, but eventually, the only one left is Wanda and this woman that she has found shelter with who was kind of like a, a prepper, like a survivalist. You know, she had a stockpile oh. of food. She grew and gardens. Safe space. Right. She figured deal. out the whole thing. But then a lot of people become very lawless, like the people oh. that remain. So you don't know when you go out in your boat to go fishing. <laughs> If you're going to come, come back. back or if somebody's going to take all that stuff that you've so carefully curated and chosen. So it was a really interesting book. I can't say I love this book, but it's a type of book that I'm going to be thinking about for a long time. And sometimes that's the mark of a good book. Yeah. You don't so, necessarily like it. Right. But no, it's, it's hard to say there. you like what's going on because everything that's going on is pretty terrifying. But yet in yeah. the back of your mind, you're thinking, I can totally see this happening. Uh -huh. It's not so far-fetched that it seems out of reach. But um, it's told in four parts, like power, water, light, and time. And that was the only thing about this book is um, Wanda kind of has a mysterious... I don't know whether you could call it a power, but it's almost like a mystical realism where she goes into the water. It's like creatures like little abibas or that light up are drawn to her for whatever reason. And I don't know if that's where the light pirate comes in. I'm not yeah. sure. But um, the writing in this book was kind of terrible and beautiful at the same time, which was another thing that I liked about it. I liked the writing style. Um, and the fact that there was some humanity with the different characters, yeah, it was uh, it was definitely a good book. I think it would make a great book for a book club. It sounds like there's a lot in there to a lot dissect. to discuss. Yeah. Yes, so um, especially I'm wondering that title even. Yeah, the light pirate. Yeah, the pirate stealing light. Yeah, who oh. is the pirate? Yeah, what is the pirate? Right. So that was my my challenge. My Cli-Fi. That was your comfort zone one? That was out of my comfort of, zone. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, because that sounds like it was... Uh, Uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. More of a Kirstra book, if you remember <laughs> Kirstra, yeah. So, under the same challenge, um, I stayed in my comfort zone, but tried a new genre. I guess I reached out of my comfort zone, too, kind of. Okay. So, I decided I was going to try some poetry. And I decided I was going to see what Mary Oliver was all about because she kept popping up in my Facebook feed. I don't know how these algorithms work or whatever, but I would keep getting these posts with a Mary Oliver poem. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe I've posted too many photos of boats and marshes and trees or something and yes because a lot of her poetry at least what i have read is very in nature inspired and yeah very nature inspired and very simple um i i found i really was drawn to her because of the imagery the nature imagery especially the shoreline imagery um I did a little deep dive into learning some more about her, and she lived on Cape Cod for 40 years, and oh, wow. all of a sudden it was an aha moment. Oh, that's why I, um, it's all that ocean beach imagery that is my upbringing and my 
happy place, so to speak. Right, where you grew up. Yeah, so um, so I tried a couple of her old or, or more recent um, collections and just kind of went through them, picking and choosing and didn't really go cover to cover, mm -hmm. just kind of selecting what looked interesting to me, reading it and digesting it. And I discovered I really like that kind of poetry where you can just kind of sit and meditate a little bit with it. It's and funny because I put a hold on one of her books for the same reason. Something I was looking at somewhere on social media popped up. It's like, huh, I like this. Maybe I'll... Maybe I'll look at this sometime. So I can't say I've ever read like an entire book of her poetry, mm -hmm. but I have liked and at different times read things that yeah. she's written. And I was really surprised she had quite a long career. She only recently died in 2019. And um, she was no lightweight. She did win a Pulitzer. She won the National Book Award. She never graduated from college, but she got awarded all sorts of... Um, Was she our National Poet Laureate or maybe the State of Massachusetts Poet Laureate? Oh, I don't know about that. Yeah. I don't know. But she she had a great run of it. She was producing like a collection every two years. And um, so I don't know how I never knew about her before. She slipped past me. I guess she wasn't on my my English professor's read list. But um, Well, I don't think a lot of people read poetry anymore. So it's kind of nice that you discovered her. Yeah, and I would really recommend it, especially to anybody who maybe kind of lost their focus during COVID and mm -hmm. they need to kind of get back into reading. I would say she's very accessible and can just kind of maybe, I don't know, give you some peace too. Yeah. So nice. Anyway, Mary Oliver. All right. I don't think I did one for Challenge 4. Well, I have, but I think I've already talked about them on Book Rig, so I can't talk about it again. Um, but it's Read a Book Club Choice, and it could be one of our book clubs here, or it could be like a celebrity book club, like, you know, Read with Jenna, Reese's Book Club, Oprah. So. Well, the book that I... I said was for that challenge hasn't really been selected by a book club yet but I know it's going to be because it is a uh, it's just a natural I think so if I can oh, we'll just yes, throw that means, in there yeah. some book club out there just say you you are reading this it's on your list so that I'm not a liar um the book was The Breakaway by Jennifer Weiner and it was just published, mm -hmm. so um, it's definitely going to be one of those. I think it was book club on reads. somebody's staff favorite list at the end of 2023, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, really? Yeah, maybe okay. Kathy's or. Yeah, yeah. So it's pub It's by Jennifer Weiner, who a lot of people will have read. She's written 19 books. Um, that summer, big summer, misses everything. In her shoes, good in bed, um, and. I liked it, um, and at first I was thinking, well, this is just going to be a beach read kind of book, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't beach season, and it actually tackles some pretty heavy topics, but in that typical Jennifer Weiner way, so topics about body image and women's right to choose and what choices women do have available to them in all different areas of their lives okay and um so the setup was uh we've got 30 year old abby and she's very comfortable in her life she has some odd jobs and she's a member of a biking club she's got friends and a kind of boring but nice fiance who she knows from way back in her early younger days when she was forced to go to fat camp uh oh, um, thanks to her mom. And, but she's at peace with her plus sized body. And she's obviously very um, physical, physically fit, but she's a biker. So she has a feeling there's something not quite right in her life. She can't put up, she can't pinpoint it. And 
She also has this memory of a fantastic night with one guy uh, from two years ago. And that's nudging at her brain, too. Like, wow, that was maybe that's what love really is kind of spark. But she's never seen him again. It was quite a night, but that's it. So anyhow, Abby's given this opportunity to, at the last minute, go and lead a biking tour, a cycling tour along the Empire State Trail. So that runs from New York City all the way up to Niagara Falls along the Erie Canal. We know it well because here we are in Rochester. Mm -hmm. And um, Oh, no wonder Kathy liked this book. And I like that premise. That's actually why I grabbed it at first. It was like a a fun read about the the, uh, Erie Canal Trail. I'm in. Mm -hmm. So anyway, she sets off. And that's when things start to get complicated, because guess who signed up for the ride? The man from two years ago. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And she has to pretend that she doesn't really have any association with him, because her mom is on the trip, too. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's horrible. And so, anyhow... As you ride along the trail, there's all sorts of interpersonal relationships um, coming up out of the group. There's all different. There's another daughter, mother, and they have their issues. And there's, you just learn about these different people who've kind of come together as a little community as they're riding along. And, um, but like I said, it's not just light fluff. They do have a lot of more serious topics that they're delving into. And um, I just, I enjoyed it. I think there's stuff to talk about. Okay. Maybe not quite as much as with your pirate, light pirate. Yeah, but it might be a little more fun. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And for people who don't know about that cycling trail, I think it would be really cool for them to discover what is along the path and the significant historic uh, spots and other stuff like that. So fun. That was my book book club suggestion okay well the next one is very easy it's participate in our weekly reading chat on facebook or email us a book review and i have um been participating in that weekly you know the monday night book chat and it's fun i've actually added a few new books to my to be read list which i will update later i think we're going to do an episode of books that were suggested by that book chat. Molly I saw and I. a lot of titles on there last night, specifically. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, so that's going to be fun. Challenge six is try a new recipe with one of our cookbooks. And I think you oh, and yeah. I have both got one of these. Mine, okay, I if somebody says the word Appalachia, I'm all in. So this is called Praise Song for the Kitchen Ghosts by Crystal Wilkinson. And it's stories and recipes from her family kitchen but the thing is is her her opening sentence of the book is people are always surprised that black people reside in the hills of Appalachia which just kind of like drew me right in um so her family has been there since the 1800s so five generations have lived in the hills of Casey County Kentucky uh, and her foremothers are her kitchen ghosts so that's what that's the kitchen ghost. that's the kitchen okay. ghost in the thing because most of what she learned has been passed down and passed down and there's certain recipes it's it's more a like a food memoir than and then a recipe book although there are recipes at the end of each like story or chapter but she said food is never just about the present. It tethers us to the past. And the first chapter is when she was talking about the first woman in her family that was there. She was actually enslaved, but she married her husband, who was her owner. And the first thing that he deeded to her was a lot of kitchen equipment, which she found fascinating. Like later he yeah. deeded her land and everything, but like the first thing he gave her were all these kitchen kitchen things um 
So she had three sons and seven daughters, so quite wow. a, a family lineage to go down. And she had a really funny thing in there about, not funny, but very poignant about funeral food. And if you've ever been to a Southern funeral. I haven't. Oh, the food is great. It, it's like everybody in the community will come around. Like in December, I just went, one of my college friends, her mom passed away. And yeah. um, another friend and I, we flew down and went to North Carolina for the service and, you know, just to be there for her. But all the church ladies, I mean, you've got the fried chicken, you've got your pimento cheese, you've got your jello salads, you've got a whole table full of cakes and, you know, ham and biscuits. and It sounds yummy. Oh, it's fa it's fabulous. So that was some of the things in, in this book. Um, she had an old-fashioned spice and jam cake. Yeah, that sounds good. She's got a hot milk cake, chicken and dumplings. She calls them dressed eggs, but they're deviled eggs. And my God, do I love a good deviled egg. Mm -hmm. um, and she makes them just like my mom used to make them, just with the, the mayonnaise. Pickle relish. Pickle relish, you know, mustard, little paprika on the top, no so fancy pantsy stuff. Oh, the paprika was the fancy part for oh, my yeah. mom. Oh, yeah. But now there's all kinds of things oh, yeah. on deviled eggs. Um, homemade angel food cake, which I made for my parents' 40th wedding anniversary. I remember making a homemade angel food cake. And one thing I really want to try are her praise song biscuits that are actually made with shortening. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I don't know if I should eat that, but I'm going to. And pimento cheese with a kick. I don't know about you, but I love pimento cheese. I've never had pimento cheese. Oh, dear God, yeah. Gotta Is it get a your... southern thing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Got to get yourself some pimento cheese. It's a perfect dip. Perfect appetizer. Um and the other one I want to mention briefly is once you make all this food, there's another book. And this kind of <laughs> ties in with February, Black History Month, but it's called Juke Joints, Jazz Clubs, and Juice, Cocktails from Two Centuries of African-American Cookbooks. And it's Tony Tipton Marsh Martin. And she had another cookbook. I can't think of the name of it right Jubilee. now. Jubilee. 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 Right. That was very popular. But um, in that one, I want to try the peach sangria. I, I saw that recipe. Yeah. Oh, I like sangria. So. Hey, maybe we could have a party in the name of, you know, book break. That's someday. right. For the challenge. Woo. I mean, <laughs> 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 got to do it. All right. So what was your, you had a cookbook too. My cookbook is really boring compared to yours, oh, but hmm. it's very practical, very practical. It's called Downshiftology by Lisa Bryant and published in 2022. The full title is Downshiftology Healthy Meal Prep Cookbook, 100 Plus Make Ahead Recipes and Quick Assembly Meals. Mm. So, it sounds like I mean? something I should be interested in. <laughs> I don't know. I think I might go for your jazz clubs and juice there. Yeah. I don't know. But the reason for the, that I wanted to kind of highlight this cookbook is because I've been trying recipes from it and I keep, I've borrowed this from the library three times now. Yeah, I think it's a book maybe I should Probably buy. should break down and buy. I think I should. But anyhow, about a year ago, we had a little medical scare, health scare with my husband. And we had to kind of revisit, even though we thought we were eating in a healthy way, we had to even get healthier mm -hmm. and more serious about um, uh, certain sodium content, fat content, and stuff like that. So... There I was panicking, you know, reading every label and r looking for all these sodium-free cookbooks and this and that. And then I landed on this downshiftology person. She popped up in my Facebook feed, too. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, again, the Gotta algorithms. Gotta love the Facebook Gotta algorithm. Love it. But I found she'd pop up and there would be a recipe each time she popped up. And I'd be like, hmm, this sounds like it might work. And then I would print it out. And then, hmm, this might work too. And then I was like, why doesn't she just have a cookbook? Well, she finally published a cookbook. It's her one and only. And the deal is with her, she actually isn't a chef. She's not a nutritionist. She's not a dietitian. She's a woman who had her own personal health crisis um, about a decade ago, and she needed to change her lifestyle. And she was diagnosed with a bunch of autoimmune diseases and things like that. So she started doing her own research and 
created this uh, social media following, and apparently she's on YouTube with, what was the figure, 2.5 million subscribers. So she's got a following. I have actually... I've, I'm really just with the written, with the actual physical cookbook um, because I can look at things at my own pace and I love the photos in it. And, but her deal is she downshifted. She kind of went a little slower and it almost sounds like Scientology, downshiftology. Yeah. But it that, is, that it gets, is an that occult. That gets dangerous or, there. No. <laughs> um, so... She, the goal with her is, and if anyone is interested in kind of doing this um, more healthy eating, it's eating more veggies, cooking from home more frequently, and ditching processed foods. Um, the problem is life is busy, so the solution is her method, the meal prep and the healthy big batch recipes that can be frozen or repurposed into a, different meals, mix and match meals. And then her kind of signature thing is creating a buffet bar in your refrigerator in your pantry. So you have your items ready to go. You do your prep ahead of time. And so then you don't have to think so much about right. prepping, getting your meals together. It's good for people who are gluten-free or it's very low or no, it doesn't have any refined sugar in it. Um, dairy is optional or... Um, unnecessary and so it's not preachy in any way and it's not a particular diet it's just trying to uh, give people the tools to eat healthier okay. and less processed stuff all right and I guess I have to buy the book <laughs> if only I knew where to buy a book <laughs> oh I think you know that <laughs> So challenge seven was revisit a classic or read one you've had on your list. I have not done this yet. Um, I am not sure what I'm going to read, but like we were talking, it's not going to be something that's a thousand pages long. Yeah, I think my classic has to be shorter too. And I don't know why, I just had a little epiphany. I think I want to read Jane Eyre again. I am not a huge Jane Eyre fan. You're kidding. No, I'm not. Oh. And it's so many people's, one of their favorite books, but yeah, maybe I should revisit it, but yeah. No, mine won't be Jane Eyre. I was thinking The Old Man of the Sea by Hemingway, because it's like, yeah, no. that big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Confederacy of Dunces. If only we knew what that book was about. I know. That's, that's, a, that's a Sean book. So. Yeah, that would be on mine. I think I read it probably once every three years, though. Really? Yeah. Okay. Whenever I feel wayward in my in my spirituality or my chi, I'll read that and realize I'm not that bad. <laughs> well, I might have to read that now. I think that would give us some insight into Sean's just for being, yeah, just yeah. for Sean, our producer. Yeah, that, that's his suggestion. Confederacy of Dunces. So, all right. Challenge eight, you've already done because you're listening to Book Break Podcast or hey. watching the video, so bing, easy peasy. Challenge nine, start a new hobby or check out a craft, do-it-yourself book, or explore creative bug. I am doing pop art pet portraits for my <laughs> kids for Valentine's Day, so maybe I can show you what I've done. And I'm going to be doing it as a class here in the future, probably mm. June, I think, mm -hmm. so... Did you get that from Creative Bug? No, or? I didn't. I actually got this from TikTok trying to find program ideas. And I should link to the lady who does it because she's fantastic. The only thing I will say is they make it look so easy. It's like, bing, bang, you oh, know, do this, do that. And, you know, then you have this great thing. And I've, I've had to tweak and do things. And it's watch her video probably. She probably has had at least 100 views due to me, you know, watching, clicking, you know, pausing, seeing what she's doing. But, um, yeah. Are you, are you starting a new hobby or anything? Well, yeah. And um, I really haven't delved too much into Creative Bug yet. But there are a lot of interesting looking projects on there. 
And there was one that sucked me in. I just have to watch the video and get the materials. Oh, that's right. It's you said Japanese uh, cherry, cherry blossoms. blossoms. They're paper cherry blossoms. You do a little dyeing of the paper yourself, create the blossoms, and then stick them on a branch. So I started the first part of the project. We went on a hike uh, last weekend, and I was like, hey, we need to get a branch. And so... Um, <laughs> I actually didn't find a good branch, so it's still on the to-do list. Okay. But going to try that one. So, All right. Last one is book of choice. <laughs> so I think... Do you have a book of choice? I don't... I didn't really bring one to talk about today because I had so many other things, but... Something in the stack of shame, perhaps? Oh, yeah. What is the stack of shame? Oh, that's the books that you keep saying that you're going to read, but you don't really read... Oh yeah! Oh. I actually read every like Barbara Kingsolver. Yeah, the Bean Trees. <laughs> there uh, you go. I, I don't know why that so quickly came to mind. It was a favorite book of a friend of mine. Everybody's and, got a stack. Yeah. yeah, but I do have a book for that. Okay, well, and let's actually, hear about yours. Probably, I should have probably talked about it for the book club choice because again, it this one is a solid book cho- book club pick. Lots to discuss. And this I, one is on my list. So, so maybe I'll read this one as my The Berry choice. Pickers. Yeah. And it's a debut novel by Amanda Peters. It was published in late 2023. And it just won the 2023 Barnes & Noble Discover Prize winner. That goes to a debut novel of oh, the wow. year. Okay. And winner of the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. And I read the I've read it twice now and the first time I don't think my head was in the right place because I I think I was expecting something different of it and that totally colored my reading of it and so going back again I really like it a lot and so the story is there's a young I I have to pronounce this correctly I watched a YouTube video because I want to honor the um, name of the nation, the Mi'kmaq um, tribe. She's a Mi'kmaq girl uh, named Ruthie. She's, capt- she's kidnapped from the blueberry fields of Maine, where she summers with her family as, sh- as they work. She's only four years old. Her brother, Joe, is six years old, and he's the last to see her. And Joe carries that guilt with him for the rest of his life on his return home to Nova Scotia, which is where they come from. It haunts all the family, and it's just um, throughout the whole book. Meanwhile, in Maine, there's a girl named Norma who grows up in a quiet, secretive family, never really feeling she belongs. Her father is very emotionally distant. Her mother is extremely overprotective. And over the years, Norma's in search of a truth and a place to belong. She just doesn't feel like she's what she, what they say she is. Right. And she has dreams, and she has visions, and her mother tells her it's her imagination, and she's making things up, but she remembers things. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it's a book that's very character-driven. It's not plot-driven, and it's told in the alternating voices of Joe and Norma. Okay. Um, there's so many themes in this, in this book, so many things that could be discussed. First off, the, the search for truth, the family who lost... The little girl. Mm-hmm. They're searching. They they have been... No one has helped them in their search for this little girl. And Is it's it because, because they're, they're indigenous. Native, it's yeah, because they're indigenous people. Say. And they're not given um, any of the attention. Right. That the sheriff writes it off right in the very beginning when, when she's gone missing. He's like, he he doesn't do an investigation. So they search and they search. They search all summer long uh, during the berry picking season. And they can't find her. She's disappeared into thin air. Um, so they're searching. And then Norma, she's searching for truth. 
she just she knows and then as she gets older there are discrepancies in what she's been told by her mother and um she's noticing things like there are no family photos and there's uh just indications to her even her skin color that there's something different um the trauma is through it with joe especially um he feels guilty Mm -hmm. and even though he was only six years old it's with him for the rest of his life and his poor mother um who's just devastated by this and it's um the persistence of love because they're a very tight family um family secrets obviously racism and the rereading i really saw so many indications that i hadn't read hadn't noticed in my first reading i think maybe i was just looking for more plot the first time right and it touches upon uh a couple of the kids in Joe's family were sent away to the Indian boarding schools, allowed to come home twice a year. And after the um, kidnapping, when they go back home and the Indian agent comes to them and wants to take away the rest of the children because the parents aren't responsible. Oh. And, and then other, I mean, that's systemic racism. Right. There's other underlying more covert racism just comments and and other things that you see happening to them anyhow um so lots to talk about with with different themes and plots the author is of Mi'kmaq Mi'kmaq um it used to be pronounced in the old days Mi'kmaq which is inappropriate and that's the pronunciation I was I knew growing up because I think I told you I have a friend who is of um, Mi'kmaq um, descent, but knows nothing about her background. And I'm also um, of Nova Scotian descent, but the Western European um, immigrants, settlers. So we have that little disparity there. Anyhow, um, anyway, the author is Miggy Mach and lives in Nova Scotia, and the story was inspired by her father's stories of going to Berry Pick in Maine as a migrant worker, and she went and visited the Berry Fields, and that kind of inspired the story. Wow. Yeah, that one's been on my so, list for a while. <laughs> there's a lot in there that I've been trying to digest. Yeah. So... Well, hopefully we've given you some suggestions for how to do our 10 to try challenge. We've got some great prizes, so we'd love to see what you guys are reading for the challenge or see if you have any suggestions for us, mm. particularly in the revisiting a classic. We're always open for suggestions. But um, thank you so much for joining me today. I think we've talked a lot about some great books and different things that we've done. A lot um, of different topics. Yeah, a lot of different types of books. So. And there's so many more to read. That's right. <laughs> Always. But thanks for visiting with us, and we will see you next time on Book Break. Book Break is a production of the Reese Public Library, made possible through the support of the friends of the Reese Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Sean Greif.